Epilepsy, the first seizure, usually occurs between one and five years of age. So this slide of me doing a bungee jump shows many of the features of a typical seizure because you'll note that I have a blank stare. My limbs, I can assure you, are rigid, as you can see, with my arms outstretched. And another feature is urination. But had you and I jumped in tandem, we could have had a very lucid discussion about the correctness of our decision to jump. So I didn't show the other feature of a typical seizure, meaning there was no altered consciousness or no altered mental status in this situation. Now this dog, as you'll see towards the end of the slide, does show altered consciousness, but in addition it has autonomic signs not of urination but salivation. It's got abnormal motor activity. And as we see it coming out of the seizure very shortly, it's rather distracted appearance then snaps back into reality. Oh, what's going on? So this dog does show altered mental status. Now there's one other feature of a typical seizure which I find very useful and that is stereotypic nature of a seizure. But let's jump ahead to the next slide because we'll see some more of that dog in a minute. But this is a very important summary slide for any animal that you see that's having a seizure. The question you ask the owner is, what, how old was the animal when it had its first seizure? Was it less than a year of age when its seizures started? In which case, although it could be juvenile onset epilepsy, it's much more likely to have either metabolic disease, such as, let's write a shunt or something, or inflammatory disease, such as an encephalitis. Epilepsy, um, one to five years of age, is the typical age of onset. Um, a few of them, like small toy breed dogs, or any small dog could have uh, meningitis, like a GME. And then over seven years of age, although they could occasionally have epilepsy, as we'll see in the next slide, much more likely cause for their seizures would be neoplastic disease, some sort of brain tumour, or a different type of metabolic disease. Occasionally they'll, they'll have, have a shunt, but there's another type of uh, metabolic disease you should think of in a 10-year-old dog that comes in with seizures. And that's right, so hypoglycemia, secondary to uh, an insulinoma, would be something important to think of. Now to address the age incidence, uh, we, there's no data on dogs, but this is a an article from a human journal that talks about um, epileptic people and most people the age of onset of their seizures is before 20 as you'll see in this graph but of the 121 people about five of them as you'll see towards the right the age of onset of their seizures was after age 50 so let's say four percent of uh, human beings show an onset of seizures uh, in late middle age to uh, older age. I've got to be careful here. I think I'm in the 50 to 60 range. So. so that validates the slide that we saw previously. So greater than 7, unlikely to be epilepsy. Now the other feature about seizures is if ever you see an animal with focal seizures, it makes epilepsy much less likely. It strongly suggests some sort of structural disease, and by structural disease I mean either a tumour or encephalitis, something that's uh, more severe or indeed isolated to one area of the brain. And this animal that we saw before, this is the section where he's got some focal motor activity. You'll note in this seizure, very similar except his right front leg is uh, picked up, and also he was tending to to twitch more on one side of his face, but it doesn't show in this section of the video. But if ever you see an animal where one side of its face is twitching or uh, one leg is uh, held up, then that's strong indication for focal seizures. 
and indicates some sort of structural disease as listed down the bottom, the most common ones being a tumour or an encephalitis. So the final topic I want to address is how do we get assessment of deep pain how do we get assessment of deep pain sensation correct what are the tricks and there's a couple of tricks that I use for this now the first thing to bear in mind does this animal have voluntary motor function now we're going to talk exclusively here about the rear legs I'm not going to address the front legs um, it's very unusual actually for animals to lose deep pain sensation with a cervical lesion couple of exceptions, but not common at all. But let's just talk about um, thoracolumbar abnormalities, T3, L3. If the animal's got obvious or any, indeed any, real voluntary motor function, nearly always it's got deep pain sensation. When you're assessing deep pain sensation, you're looking for a conscious recognition of your stimulus. So let's look at this dog. This dog has even in reverse, no motor function in its rear legs. And you'll see here, Karen Mignana, the neurologist, as he walks forward, pretty well no voluntary motor function, maybe a tiny bit, but it's difficult to tell when their hips are swaying like that. So this dog, well, who knows? It might have no sensation, so let's check. Karen checks, squeezes his toe. Well, clearly, he's got cerebral recognition of that stimulus to his toes. And that was repeatable, very convincing, even though I only show, showed you a short segment of video here. This dog, on the other hand, you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner, my hemostats clamped faithfully to his toe. He could care less. This poor dog has no deep pain sensation following quite severe trauma due to a spinal fracture. So how are we going to be certain about that? So when you check deep pain sensation, you want to really induce a withdrawal reflex first because the withdrawal reflex is simply that, a reflex, and it's often present in dogs with no sensation. What the reflex can do, though, is it can alter the animal's body position, so that can make them go, hey, something's going on at the rear end. So you want to get that out of the way first and then concentrate on whether they have any cerebral recognition. So once they've withdrawn the foot, then clamp the nail bed with a pair of hemostats and look and see if they respond. Um, you can repeat it on the tail um, to convince yourself. And if your suspicion is that the dog has no sensation, the key, I find, is to look for a line of analgesia, and I'll show you that. So this animal, we do it a bit arse backwards. We uh, check his tail sensation first, and he could care less that I'm clamping on his tail with a big pair of clamps. His tail movement like that is a mass reflex which is often seen in dogs that have no sensation or cats. Same thing, it's a disordered reflex. So now we're looking for a line of analgesia. his tail going, poor little guy. You see his paniculus just kicked in there and he looked round as if, mm, I think I feel that. Yeah, so he feels that. Maybe not the best bit of video, so I want to show you another one that shows this clearly. So to test a dog for a line of analgesia, what you're doing is stimulating their skin in the rear end of their body, and you get to a certain point and wham, that happens. Well, that's very convincing. That dog has no sensation behind the line that we've drawn on his skin, because even though he's a bit grumpy and fed up with us doing this and you can't blame him, he has no idea we're doing it until we get to here and then bam, turns around. Let's see another example of this as well. This dog, too, has no idea what we're doing until we get just in front of that line, and then he fidgets <coughs> quite noticeably. Let's do this again without someone holding his head this time, and look, he 
can sense it in front of the line but not behind the line. So an obvious line of analgesia on both sides of his body, very convincing that this dog has absence of deep pain, caudal to the lesion, presence of deep pain in front of the lesion. So in summary, the way to tell if an animal has deep pain sensation is ask yourself first of all, does it have voluntary motor function? If it has, well then it usually has deep pain sensation. If you're going to check deep pain sensation, check on the withdrawal reflex, but induce that first. Disregard the animal's response because it might just be the fact that he's responding to, she is responding to a change in body position. Once you've induced the withdrawal, clamp the nail bed with hemostats and look for cerebral recognition of pain. You can repeat it on the tail. Uh, deep pain tends to disappear last in the tail. But if your suspicion is that this animal has no deep pain sensation in the rear end of its body, convince yourself 100% by finding that line of analgesia. And if you see it, you'll be pretty certain. Now why bother? Well, this is why bother, because these figures in the table at least relate to thoracolumbar disc disease. The success rate, and I'm talking here with respect to surgery, um, success rate for an animal that has motor function is about 95%, and that's a fair number of dogs, uh, 38 dogs. If the dog is paralyzed, no movement in its rear legs, just like the dachshund that we saw first of all, but has good deep pain sensation, over 90% of them will recover. If the dog is paralyzed but has no deep pain sensation, there's a significant drop-off, so only two-thirds of them will recover. Now look at the bottom slide. If, on the other hand, you're seeing an animal not with a disc herniation, like a dachshund, but you're seeing a big dog that's got out and been hit by a car and has got a back fracture, if it has no deep pain sensation, its chances of recovering, whether someone does surgery or not, however you manage it, less than 5%. So very, very important for the prognosis of that animal. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, listening to this uh, short presentation. And a big thanks as well, again, once more to our sponsors, without whom none of this would be possible.